Chapters 13 and 14 of Beautiful Joe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. Beautiful Joe by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 13 The Beginning of an Adventure the first winter i was at the morrises i had an adventure it was a week before christmas and we were having cold frosty weather not much snow had fallen but there was plenty of skating and the boys were off every day with their skates on a little lake near fairport jim and i often went with them and we had great fun scampering over the ice after them and slipping at every step on this saturday night we had just gotten home it was quite dark outside and there was a cold wind blowing so when we came in the front door and saw the red light from the big hall stove and the blazing fire in the parlor they looked very cheerful i was quite sorry for jim that he had to go to his kennel however he didn't mind the boys got a plate of nice warm meat for him in a bowl of milk and carried them out and afterwards he went to sleep jim's kennel was a very snug one being a spaniel he was not a very large dog but his kennel was as roomy as if he was a great dane he told me that mr morris and the boys made it and he liked it very much because it was large enough for him to get up in the night and stretch himself when he got tired of lying in one position it was raised a little from the ground and it had a thick layer of straw over the floor above was a broad shelf wide enough for him to lie on and covered with an old catskin sleigh robe jim always slept here in cold weather because it was farther away from the ground to return to this december evening i can remember yet how hungry i was i could scarcely lie still till miss laura finished her tea mrs morris knowing that her boys would be very hungry had mary broil some beef steak and roast some potatoes for them and didn't they smell good they ate all the steak and potatoes it didn't matter to me for i wouldn't have gotten any if they had been left mrs morris could not afford to give the dogs good meat that she had gotten for her children so she used to get the butcher to send her liver and bones and tough meat and mary cooked them and made soup and broth and mixed porridge with them for us we never got meat three times a day miss laura said it was all very well to feed hunting dogs on meat but dogs that are kept about a house get ill if they are fed too well so we had meat only once a day and bread and milk porridge or dog biscuits for our other meals i made a dreadful noise when i was eating ever since jenkins cut my ears off i had had trouble breathing the flaps that kept the wind and dust from the inside of my ears now that they were gone my head was stuffed up all the time the cold weather made me worse and sometimes i had such trouble to get my breath that it seemed as if i would choke if i had opened my mouth and breathed through it as i have seen some people doing i would have been more comfortable but dogs always like to breathe through their noses. "'You have taken more cold,' said Miss Laura this night, as she put my plate of food on the floor for me. "'Finish your meat and then come sit by the fire with me. What, do you want more?' I gave a little bark, so she filled my plate for the second time. Miss Laura never allowed anyone to meddle with us when we were eating one day she found willie teasing me by snatching at a bone i was gnawing willie she said what would you do if you were just sitting down to the table feeling very hungry and just as you began to eat your meat and potatoes i would come along and snatch the plate from you 
I don't know what I'd do, he said laughingly, but I'd want to wallop you. Well, she said, I'm afraid that Joe will wallop you some day if you worry him about his food, for even a gentle dog will sometimes snap at anyone who disturbs him at his meals, so you had better not try his patience too far. Willie never teased me after that, and I was very glad, for two or three times I had been tempted to snarl at him. After I finished my tea, I followed Miss Laura upstairs. She took up a book and sat down in a low chair, and I lay down on the hearth rug beside her. Do you know, Joe, she said with a smile, why you scratch with your paws when you lie down, as if to make yourself a hollow bed, and turn around a great many times before you lie down? Of course I did not know, so I only stared at her. Years and years ago, she went on, gazing down at me, there weren't any dogs living in people's houses as you are, Joe. They were all wild creatures running about the woods. They always scratched among the leaves to make a comfortable bed for themselves, and the habit has come down to you, Joe, for you are descended from them. This sounded very interesting, and I think she was going to tell me some more about my wild forefathers, but just then the rest of the family came in. I always thought that this was the snuggest time of the day when the family all sat around the fire, Mrs. Morris sewing, the boys reading or studying, and Mr. Morris with his head buried in a newspaper, and Billy and I on the floor at their feet. This evening I was feeling very drowsy, and had almost dropped asleep when Ned gave me a push with his foot. He was a great tease, and he delighted in getting me to make a simpleton of myself. I tried to keep my eyes on the fire, but I could not, and just had to turn and look at him. He was holding his book up between himself and his mother, and was opening his mouth as wide as he could, and throwing back his head and pretending to howl. For the life of me, I could not help giving a loud howl. Mrs. Morris looked up and said, Bad Joe, keep still. The boys were all laughing behind their books, for they knew what Ned was doing. Presently, he started off again, and I was just beginning another howl that might have made Mrs. Morris send me out of the room when the door opened, and a young girl called Bessie Drury came in. She had a cap on and a shawl thrown over her shoulders, and she had just run across the street from her father's house. Oh, Miss Morris! she said will you let laura come over and stay with me tonight mamma has just gotten a telegram from bungora saying her aunt mrs cole is very ill and she wants to see her and papa is going to take her there by tonight's train and she is afraid i will be lonely if i don't have laura can you not come and spend the night here said miss morris no thank you i think mamma would rather have me stay in our house very well said mrs morris I think Laura would like to go. Yes, indeed, said Laura, smiling at her friend. I will come over in half an hour. Thank you so much, said Miss Bessie, and she hurried away. After she left, Mr. Morris looked up from his paper. There will be someone in the house besides those two girls. Oh, yes, said Mrs. Morris. Mrs. Drury has her old nurse who has been with her for twenty years, and there are two maids besides, and Donald, the coachman, who sleeps over at the stable, so they are well protected. Very good, said Mr. Morris, and he went back to his paper. Of course, dumb animals do not understand all they hear spoken of, but I think human beings would be astonished if they knew how much we can gather from their looks and voices. I knew that Mr. Morris did not quite like the idea of having his daughter go to the Drury's when the master and mistress of the house were away, so I made up my mind that I would go with her. When she came downstairs with her little satchel on her arm, I got up and stood beside her. 
"'Dear old Joe,' she said, "'you must not come.' I pushed myself out the door beside her after she had kissed her mother and father and the boys. "'Go back, Joe,' she said firmly. I had to step back then, but I cried and whined, and she looked at me in astonishment. "'I will be back in the morning, Joe,' she said gently. "'Don't squeal in that way.' Then she shut the door and went out. I felt dreadfully. I walked up and down the floor and ran to the window and howled without having to look at Ned. Mrs. Morris peered over her glasses at me in utter surprise. Boys, she said, did you ever see Joe act in that way before? No, mother, they all said. Mr. Morris was looking at me very intently. He had always taken more notice of me than any other creature about the house, and I was very fond of him. Now I ran up and put my paws on his knees. Mother, he said, turning to his wife, let the dog go. Very well, she said in a puzzled way. Jack, just run over with him and tell Mrs. Drury how he is acting, and that I will be very much obliged if she will let him stay all night with Laura. Jack sprang up, seized his cap, and raced down the front steps across the street through the gate, and up the graveled walk where the little stones were all hard and fast in the frost. The Drurys lived in a large white house with trees all around it and a garden at the back. They were rich people and had a great deal of company. Through the summer, I had often seen carriages at the door, and ladies and gentlemen in light clothes walking over the lawn, and sometimes I smelled nice things they were having to eat. They did not keep any dogs, nor pets of any kind, so Jim and I never had an excuse to call there. Jack and I were soon at the front door, and he rang the bell and gave me in charge of the maid who opened it. The girl listened to his message from Mrs. Drury. Then she walked upstairs, smiling and looking at me over her shoulder. There was a trunk in the upper hall, and an elderly woman was putting things in it. A lady stood watching her, and when she saw me, she gave a little scream. Oh, nurse, look at that horrid dog. Where did he come from? Put him out, Susan. I stood quite still, and the girl who had brought me upstairs gave her Jack's message. Certainly, certainly, said the lady when the maid finished speaking. If he is one of the Morris dogs, he is sure to be a well-behaved one. Tell the little boy to thank his mamma for letting Laura come over, and say that we will keep the dog with pleasure. Now, nurse, we must hurry. The cab will be here in five minutes. I walked softly into a front room, and there I found my dear Miss Laura. Miss Bessie was with her, and they were cramming things into a portmanteau. They both ran out to find out how I came there, and just then a gentleman came hurriedly upstairs and said the cab had come. There was a scene of great confusion and hurry, but in minutes it was all over. The cab had rolled away, and the house was quiet. "'Nurse, you must be tired. You had better go to bed,' said Miss Bessie, turning to the elderly woman as we all stood in the hall. "'Susan, will you bring some supper to the dining room for Miss Morris and me? What will you have, Laura?' Well, "'What are you going to have?' asked Miss Laura with a smile. Hot chocolate and tea biscuits. Then I will have the same. Bring some cake too, Susan, said Miss Bessie, and something for the dog. I dare say he would like some of that turkey that was left from dinner. If I had had any ears, I would have pricked them up at this, for I was very fond of fowl, and I never got any at the Morris's unless it might be a stray bone or two. What fun we had over our supper! The two girls sat at the big dining table and sipped their chocolate and laughed and talked, 
and i had the skeleton of a whole turkey on a newspaper that susan spread on the carpet i was very careful not to drag it about and miss bessie laughed at me till the tears came in her eyes that dog is such a gentleman she said see how he holds bones on the paper with his paws and strips all the meat off with his teeth oh joe joe you are a funny dog and you are having a funny supper i have heard of quail on toast but i never heard of turkey on newspaper hadn't we better go to bed said miss laura when the hall clock struck eleven yes i suppose we had said miss bessie where is this animal to sleep i don't know said miss laura he sleeps in the stable at home or in the kennel with jim suppose susan makes him a nice bed by the kitchen stove said miss bessie susan made the bed but i was not willing to sleep in it i barked so loudly when they shut me up alone that they had to let me go upstairs with them miss laura was almost angry with me but i could not help it i had come over there to protect her and i wasn't going to leave her if i could help it miss bessie had a handsomely furnished room with a soft carpet on the floor and pretty curtains at the windows there were two single beds in it and the two girls dragged them close together so that they could talk after they got in bed before miss bessie put out the light she told miss laura not to be alarmed if she heard any one walking about in the night for the nurse was sleeping across the hall from them and she would probably come in once or twice to see if they were sleeping comfortably the two girls talked for a long time and then they fell asleep just before miss laura dropped off she forgave me and put down her hand for me to lick as i lay on a fur rug close by her bed i was very tired and i had a very soft and pleasant bed so i soon fell into a heavy sleep but i waked up at the slightest noise once miss laura turned in bed and another time miss bessie laughed in her sleep and again there were queer crackling noises in the frosty limbs of the trees outside that made me start up quickly out of my sleep there was a big clock in the hall and every time it struck i waked up once just after it had struck some hour i jumped up out of a sound nap i had been dreaming about my early home jenkins was after me with a whip and my limbs were quivering and trembling as if i had been trying to get away from him i sprang up and shook myself then i took a turn around the room the two girls were breathing gently i could scarcely hear them i walked to the door and looked out into the hall there was a dim light burning there the door of the nurse's room stood open i went quietly to it and looked in she was breathing heavily and muttering in her sleep i went back to my rug and tried to go to sleep but i could not such an uneasy feeling was upon me that i had to keep walking about i went out into the hall again and stood at the head of the staircase i thought i would take a walk through the lower hall and then go to bed again the drury's carpets were all like velvet and my paws did not make a rattling on them as they did on the oil cloth at the morrises i crept down the stairs like a cat and walked along the lower hall smelling under all the doors listening as i went there was no night light burning down here and it was quite dark but if there had been any strange person about i would have smelled him i was surprised when i got near the farther end of the hall to see a tiny gleam of light shine for an instant from under the dining room door then it went away again the dining room was the place to eat surely none of the people in the house would be there after the supper we had i went and sniffed under the door there was a smell there 
a strong smell like beggars and poor people. It smelled like Jenkins. It was Jenkins. End of chapter 13. The beginning of an adventure. Chapter 14. How we caught the burglar. What was the wretch doing in the house with my dear Miss Laura? I thought I would go crazy. I scratched at the door and barked and yelped. I sprang up on it, and though I was quite a heavy dog by this time, I felt as light as a feather. It seemed to me that I would go mad if I could not get that door open. Every few seconds I stopped and put my head down to the door sill to listen. There was a rushing about inside the room, and a chair fell over, and someone seemed to be getting out of the window. This made me worse than ever. I did not stop to think that I was only a medium-sized dog, and that Jenkins would probably kill me if he got his hands on me. I was so furious that I thought only of getting hold of him. In the midst of the noise that I made, there was a screaming and a rushing to and fro upstairs. I ran up and down the hall and halfway up the stairs and back again. I did not want Miss Laura to come down, but how was I to make her understand? There she was in her white gown, leaning over the railing and holding back her long hair, her face a picture of surprise and alarm. The dog has gone mad, screamed Miss Bessie. Nurse, pour a pitcher of water on him. The nurse was more sensible. She ran downstairs, her nightcap flying and a blanket that she had seized from her bed trailing her. There are thieves in the house, she shouted at the top of her voice, and the dog has found it out. She did not go near the dining room door, but threw open the front one, crying, Policeman! Policeman! Help! Help! Thieves! Murder! Such a screaming as that old woman made. She was worse than I was. I dashed by her, out through the hall door, and away down to the gate, where I heard someone running. I gave a few loud yelps to call Jim and leaped the gate as the man before me had done. There was something savage in me that night. I think it must have been the smell of Jenkins. I felt as if I could tear him to pieces. I have never felt so wicked since. I was hunting him as he had hunted me and my mother, and the thought gave me pleasure. Old Jim soon caught up with me, and I gave him a push with my nose to let him know I was glad he had come. We rushed swiftly on, and at the corner caught up with the miserable man who was running away from us. I gave an angry growl, and jumping up, bit at his leg. He turned around, and though it was not a very bright night, there was enough light for me to see the ugly face of my old master. He seemed so angry to think that Jim and I dared to snap at him. He caught up a handful of stones and with some bad words threw them at us. Just then, away in front of us was a queer whistle and then another one like it behind us. Jenkins made a strange noise in his throat and started to run down a side street away from the direction of the two whistles. I was afraid that he was going to get away, and though I could not hold him, I kept springing up on him, and once I tripped him up. Oh, how furious he was! He kicked me against the side of a wall and gave me two or three hard blows with a stick that he caught up and kept throwing stones at me. I would not give up, though I could scarcely see him for the blood that was running over my eyes. Old Jim got so angry whenever Jenkins touched me that he ran up behind and nipped his calves to make him turn on him. Soon Jenkins came to a high wall where he stopped and with a hurried look behind began to climb over it. The wall was too high for me to jump, 
he was going to escape what shall i do i barked as loudly as i could for someone to come and then sprang up and held him by the leg as he was getting over i had such a grip that i went over the wall with him and left jim on the other side jenkins fell on his face in the earth then he got up and with a look of deadly hatred on his face pounced upon me if help had not come i think he would have dashed my brains against the wall as he dashed out my poor little brothers against the horse's stall but just then there was a running sound two men came down the street and sprang upon the wall just where jim was leaping up and barking in distress i saw at once by their uniform and the clubs in their hand that they were policemen in one short instant they had hold of jenkins he gave up then but he stood snarling at me like an ugly dog if it hadn't been for that cur i'd have never been caught why and he staggered back and uttered a bad word it's me own dog more shame to you said one of the policemen sternly what have you been up to at this time of night to have your own dog and a quiet minister's spaniel dog chasing you through the street jenkins began to swear and would not tell them anything there was a house in the garden and just at this minute someone opened a window and called out hello there what are you doing we're catching a thief sir said one of the policemen leastwise i think that's what he's been up to could you throw us down a bit of rope we've no handcuffs here and one of us has to go to the lock-up and the other to washington street where there's a woman yelling blue murder and hurry up please sir the gentleman threw down a rope and in two minutes jenkins wrists were tied together and he was walked through the gate saying bad words as fast as he could to the policeman who was leading him good dogs said the other policeman to jim and me then he ran up the street and we followed him as we hurried along washington street and came near our house we saw lights gleaming through the darkness and heard people running to and fro the nurse's shrieking had alarmed the neighborhood the morris boys were all out in the street only half clad and shivering with cold and the drury's coachman with no hat on and his hair sticking up all over his head was running about with a lantern the neighbors' houses were all lighted up, and a good many people were hanging out of their windows and opening their doors and calling to each other to know what all this noise meant. When the policeman appeared with Jim and me at his heels, quite a crowd gathered around him to hear his part of the story. Jim and I dropped on the ground, panting as hard as we could and with little streams of water running from our tongues we were both pretty well used up jim's back was bleeding in several places from the stones that jenkins had thrown at him and i was a mass of bruises presently we were discovered and then what a fuss was made over us brave dogs noble dogs everybody said and patted and praised us we were very proud and happy and stood up and wagged our tails at least jim did and i wagged what i could then they found what a state we were in mrs morris cried and catching me up in her arms ran in the house with me and jack followed with old jim we all went to the parlor there was a good fire there and miss laura and miss bessie were sitting over it they sprang up when they saw us and right there in the parlor washed our wounds and made us lie down by the fire you saved our silver brave joe said miss bessie just wait till my papa and mamma come home and see what they will say well jack what is the latest as the morris boys came trooping into the room the policeman has been questioning your nurse and examining the dining room and has gone down to the station to make his report and do you know what he has found out said jack excitedly no what asked miss bessie 
Why, that villain was going to burn your house. Miss Bessie gave a little shriek. Why, what do you mean? Well, said Jack, they think, by what they discovered, that he planned to pack his bag with silver and carry it off. But just before he did so, he would pour oil all around the room and set fire to it, so people would not find out he had been robbing you. Why, we might have all been burned to death, said Miss Bessie. He couldn't burn the dining room without setting fire to the rest of the house. Certainly not, said Jack. That shows what a villain he is. Do they know this for certain, Jack? asked Miss Laura. Well, I suppose so. They found some bottles of oil along with the bag he had for the silver. How horrible, you darling old Joe. Perhaps you saved our lives. And pretty Miss Bessie kissed my ugly, swollen head. I could do nothing but lick her little hand, but always after that I thought a great deal of her. It is now some years since all this happened, and I might as well tell the end of it. The next day, the Drurys came home, and everything was found out about Jenkins. The night they left Fairport, he had been hanging about the station. He knew just who were left in the house, for he had once supplied them with milk, and he knew all about their family. He had no customers at this time, for after Mr. Harry rescued me, and that piece came out in the paper about him, he found that no one would take milk from him. His wife died, and some kind people put his children in an asylum, and he was obliged to sell Toby and the cows. Instead of learning a lesson from all this and leading a better life, he kept sinking lower. He was, therefore, ready for any kind of mischief that turned up, and when he saw the Drurys going away in the train, he thought he would steal a bag of silver from their sideboard, then set fire to the house, and run away and hide the silver. After a time, he would take it to some city and sell it. He was made to confess all this. Then, for his wickedness, he was sent to prison for ten years, and I hope he will get to be a better man there, and be one after he comes out. I was sore and stiff for a long time, and one day Miss Drury came over to see me. She did not love dogs as the Morrises did. She tried to, but she could not. Dogs can see the fun in things as well as people can, and I buried my muzzle in the hearth rug so she would not see how I was curling up my lip and smiling at her. You are a good dog, she said slowly. You are... Then she stopped and could not think of anything else to say to me. I got up and stood in front of her, for a well-bred dog should not lie down when a lady speaks to him. I wagged my body a little, and I would gladly have said something to help her out of her difficulty, but I couldn't. If she had stroked me, it might have helped her, but she didn't want to touch me, and I knew she didn't want me to touch her, so I just stood looking at her. Mrs. Morris, she said, turning from me with a puzzled face, I don't like animals, and I can't pretend to, for they always find me out. But can't you let that dog know that I shall feel eternally grateful to him for saving not only our property, for that is a trifle, but my darling daughter from fright and annoyance and possible injury or loss of life? I think he understands, said Mrs. Morris. He is a very wise dog. And smiling in great amusement, she called me to her and put my paws on her lap. Look at that lady, Joe. She is pleased with you for driving Jenkins away from her house. You remember Jenkins? I barked angrily and limped to the window. How intelligent he is, said Mrs. Drury. My husband has sent to New York for a watchdog, and he says that from this on our house shall never be without one. Now I must go, 
your dog is happy mrs morris and i can do nothing for him except to say that i shall never forget him and i wish he would come over occasionally to see us perhaps when we get our dog he will i shall tell my cook whenever she sees him to give him something to eat this is a souvenir for laura of that dreadful night i feel under a deep obligation to you so i am sure you will allow her to accept it then she gave mrs morris a little box and went away when miss laura came in she opened the box and found in it a handsome diamond ring on the inside of it was engraved laura in memory of december twentieth eighteen blank from her grateful friend bessie the diamond was worth hundreds of dollars and mrs morris told miss laura that she had rather she would not wear it then while she was a young girl it was not suitable for her and she knew miss drury did not expect her to do so she wished to give her a valuable present and this would always be worth a great deal of money End of chapter 14 How We Caught the Burglar